Hello everybody and welcome to another one of our live streams. Um, this is a welcome to the new year. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we thought it was a really good opportunity to kind of promote ourselves today really. We're going to produce our triangle logo. Well, we, my esteemed colleague Nat here is going to do most of the work and I'm going to con uh, comment. And com no, not comment. Commentate. There you go. <laughs> Um, firstly though I'd like to say a really big thank you to all of you who have supported us in 2018. Thank you so much for watching our live streams, we've really enjoyed them and I hope you have too. We've had lots of fun, we've also had a lot of mickey taking, mostly on at my expense, but hey my shoulders are big I can cope with that. So thank you so much, I hope you've enjoyed it and welcome to 2019. We've got loads of exciting new things that we're going to do this year. Um, and starting off with our triangle logo, which we thought was a good way to start the year. So happy new year to you all. Let's hope it's a really successful, prosperous one for all of you out there and a happy and healthy one too. So I'll hand over to my colleague, Nat. Mm -hmm. So Nat, what have you done here first? So you've, you've got a designer board that you've started with, yeah? yeah? And it looks to me as though you've mapped out our triangle logo. Yeah. I don't know if you can actually see that. I'll turn it around so you can just faintly see the outlines of the logo. Can you see that? Yeah. So Nat, just explain how you got the template first and foremost. Um, so I just uh, downloaded the template um, onto um, scaled over a different um, size paper to make sure you've got the right dimensions and then um, I pinned it on, made sure it's all level and just traced around it. Okay, so that logo you put onto just a Word document and then... Uh, no, I've uh, done paint. paint. Paint, cool. Lovely. So, yeah, that makes sense to all you guys out there. It's probably a little way over my head. Anything IT, remotely <laughs> IT is not my forte. I'll stick with flowers. Anyway, so that snapped out the, um, the, the basic sort of shape and the logo. Yeah. So I'll let her start now. So we're going to use um, chrysanthemum bloom. Uh, spray rather. These are Baltica. Yes. Yeah. So this one's Baltica. Um, there are lots of other varieties available. Where you go, Nat, you, you make a start. Lots of other varieties available. Baltica is probably one of the looser, more open, for want of a better word, fluffy um, spray chrysanthemum. If you want something that's a bit neater, a little bit tighter, possibly opt for Euro. Euro is one of your favourites, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So Nat's just soaked the area where she's going to work. And it's quite important not to over soak when you're working um, on a designer board, especially one that's this big, because it's actually going to end up incredibly heavy. And bearing in mind it has got a hard foam base, it's not a particularly strong structure if there's a, a, a quite a substantial amount of weight that it's carrying. What you will sometimes find is it becomes quite whippy if you've got a lot of weight involved. Okay, <clears throat> so Nat's cut off um, the heads of the chrysanthemum. She cut them to about centimetre, centimetre and a half. So bear in mind that the, the actual depth of foam that you're going into is not overly substantial. So you don't want to cut them too long, otherwise you're not going to be able to get them into the, into the oasis. So where you go. Now you might be a little, I'll let Matt carry on and I'll talk while she's doing that. You may be a bit concerned that perhaps you haven't soaked the um, designer foam enough. Don't worry too much about that actually, because what you will find is as the stem pushes through the oasis, it pushes the wet, the moisture all the way through as it goes in. So it's actually taking its own little water, I guess, supply with it almost. And you can soak afterwards as well. So. so this is what we actually call basing. Now theoretically, and that is doing an incredible job of that at the moment, I'll show you, while she's, she's buzzing along, I'll show you the theory. I'm just going to steal a couple of her balloons in a moment. Thank you, my lovely. <laughs> okay, so while Nat's doing that, so you've got a very round shape, obviously as you can see. So the theory is when you push the blooms into Oasis, so imagine my fingers are the Oasis, so you line them up beside each other, you've got a natural 
sort of V shape there. So that's where potentially you lay the next chrysanthemum. So you've got all of the surface area covered rather than doing them on top and then on top because you then you'll get the little gaps in between. So that, that's the theory. Let you have some chrysanthemums back. <laughs> How many heads would you normally get off one stem? Quite regularly this time of the year, when it's actually, in theory, the natural season for chrysanthemum, you can get anything from eight to ten stems. This Baltica is actually particularly good. What, what you probably need to be aware of as well when you're buying is, you buy different grades. And on our website, when you go and purchase chrysanthemums, you'll actually find that they have a grammage so they give you the weight. So obviously the, the higher the weight, so the bigger the gram, the more stem flower you're gonna get per stem. The lighter the grade or the lighter the grammage, the less flowers you'll get. So it doesn't always pay to buy cheap. Um, and you might think you're getting a real bargain, but you might find you've only got sort of four or five blooms per stem. If you just pay a little bit more money and get a, a heavier gram, you actually might find you get eight or ten so although you're paying out more money initially you've got more stems and they'll go that little bit further now that's just um, highlighted with her scissors the definition of the lines there because it's actually quite difficult to see once you start pushing all the flowers in isn't it mm. <laughs> Now you can also create a little bit of three-dimensional work if you want to, not necessarily on this occasion, but if you were doing an animal or you were replicating something that's well more three-dimensional perhaps than a logo would be, you can actually create that 3D effect by placing the stems at different levels. So in effect get a gradient, which helps to kind of define, um, define the, the design that you're making. Because as you can appreciate, no animals or living products are ever two-dimensional. So by creating that kind of contour, um, you, you can create a more lifelike appearance. You can also build up things, can't you, Nat? <clears throat> by adding perhaps little pieces of oasis onto the already flat frame, you can then create contours as well. So that, that's another way of achieving that, a little bit more definition. Now I have actually seen in the past, Nat, to get a little bit of extra definition, you've actually cut the chrysanthemum blooms. Yeah. Now that's something that was new to me. Um, every day is a school day, as they say. That's something that I've never done before. But it actually is really effective because it gives you a really sharp line of chrysanthemum, doesn't it? Yeah. Makes it look much neater, much, much neater. So you can see Nat's actually tearing off the stems here rather than using scissors. Um, that's not detrimental to the flower at all because it actually does create a slightly uneven edge to the base of the stem. So theoretically it opens more cell structure up to the water. So it's not going to be um, detrimental to the longevity of the flower. So that's our red part, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm just gonna turn that round, if that's okay. I'm yeah, gonna just trim it up. Gonna trim it. Gonna give it a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we can see that. Yeah? Excellent. I'll let Nat do her magic with the scissors. <laughs> okay. So is this what I was talking about when I was saying that you cut the edges to give it more definition? Yep. Looks very cruel, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I can hear the croissants going. Mm. <laughs> 
<laughs> joking. Yeah, we have had chocolate cake this morning for breakfast, so. <laughs> Too far too much caffeine, chocolate cake and coffee. <laughs> yeah, so much for the New Year diets. <laughs> Do you mind if I just show our viewers what an incredible difference that's made? Just finish that bit. Need a little hoover that. <laughs> Thank you, Monavie. Okay, so as you can see, where Nat's trimmed the edges of the chrysanthemum compared to the part down here, what a sharp, defined edge you've got there. Um, so especially when you're working to something like a logo or something that's got very structured straight lines, it makes a huge difference, doesn't it? Mm. Um, I know that's something you do quite a lot with football badges and things like that, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. sprayed the red part of the logo uh, which I have to say is looking brilliant. We're now going to do the green part of our word triangle. Now that's using um, a little chrysanthemum, spray chrysanthemum here called Feeling Green. Quite appropriate for the new year after all the festivities and too much chocolate and too much alcohol. <laughs> anyway, moving on, Feeling Green. So that's now going to finish the A-N-G-L-E part of the logo. So it's the same principle with these then, now as the um, white double chrysanthemums, you're just literally cutting them in the same way and popping them in. They're a little bit neater than the Baltica, aren't they? So they won't hopefully need quite so much trimming, quite so much of a haircut. <laughs> Do you prefer working with that the little feeling green or do you prefer the Baltica? Um, depends what you're what you're making really. So the, the feeling green I wouldn't necessarily uh, trim at all really because they do shatter quite easily. Um, so if you want something that's going to be quite cut and trimmed and that sort of thing then you're probably best to go for the... Something a bit more robust yeah. like the Baltica. Yeah definitely. So, in your opinion, if you're going to cut the edges off, like you have done with that, is Baltica or um, one of the other more fluffy varieties better for that, or would Euro be better? Uh, again, it depends on the, the design you're doing. If you're doing quite intricate design, like a football badge or something like that, I'd personally use the Euro, because um, it's a little bit neater, and it's, um, the heads are a little bit smaller, so therefore you can get into smaller areas a lot detail. easier. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Similar to the Baltica, how many stems would you say you get on the code green or feeling green? You tend to get slightly more, slightly less heads per stem, but again, the heavier the weight that you buy, the more flowers you'll get. Um, on average, I'd say you get between, what have we got on those ones? Probably got about seven on those, I would imagine. Seven biggish ones. Um, you're always going to get an assortment of reasonably big blooms and buds but the buds are quite useful um, for doing the smaller sort of detail pieces like for example here the little buds that are on the Baltica um, Nat's taken those and used that to create a slightly more defined part of the logo and I can see here as well you've used a slightly smaller feeling green there on that part of the A as opposed to the main body of the A. So it's all about judgment really? Yeah, and Nat did say earlier on that she was selecting, she was, oh, I used the word cherry picking, but she was selecting and being quite particular on what she used as she was going along. So your eye tends to look for the right shape and the right size, doesn't it Nat? And yeah. then you pick um, the size bloom that you need 
for that particular part of the design. That kind of comes just with experience, really, don't you think, Matt? Yeah. So it's something that you mm. sort of pick up as you go along, really. Definitely. Don't realise you're doing it half the time. No, it comes quite automatic. <laughs> it's looking really good. Simple but effective. So there's not really any kind of shape or design that you can't do. I suppose it's just a case of the amount of detail that's required in a logo. If it's a very, very intricate design, you have to go big enough to actually get enough... Yeah. What's the word? You have to make the design big enough to have sufficient space to actually create the design if it's very intricate. It's no good using a small designer board and then trying to create something that's quite quite intricate because you just it just wouldn't work. Uh, you wouldn't be able to get the flowers small enough or the detail in there. Yeah, I haven't really explained that very well, have I? No, it doesn't make makes sense. Good, yeah. good, good. Because <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people, for instance, for funeral tributes, you can use say a laminate photograph if if mm -hmm. the design is too in intricate for the size of the. You can. Posy. Yeah, you can. I did see a tribute the other day um, of Gordon's gin bottle. Oh, wow. Uh, the actual bottle was made out of the feeling green. Yeah. And um, the, the Gordon's design had been done in um, cording like we do. That's quite, quite interesting. So what would you say has been one of the most interesting funeral designs that you've done in this kind of... Um, in this kind of method then, Matt? I'd probably say the most effective one I've done from a, um, a picture point of view is a Dennis the Menace. Oh, excellent. Uh, because of all the different colours he's got in, um, in, his, in body. his clothing. Yes, it come out really well, actually. Excellent. I can remember doing a um, Minnie Mouse once. That was quite quite neat. Oh, lovely. And we also I don't remember doing a Triumph Bonneville motorcycle with a leopard print seat. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. That took two days to do that. Oh, really? That was really intricate. Right, I think that will be enough. Right, so I'm just going to turn this round. That's looking really good. Oh, sorry. Sorry, just see a little bit there. Perfect. So you can definitely see how it's starting to develop. We've got the angle bit of the triangle. <laughs> Sorry about the noise views. <laughs> Is that in the right position for Laura? Yeah, excellent. Okay. Haven't got to spray that one now either. No. <laughs> That's nice to use different textures as well. Yeah. That also adds a little bit of definition to it, doesn't it? Mm. And helps to... Um, identify different parts as well. Yes. Yeah. Your eye naturally focuses on all the different bits and pieces then as opposed to seeing it all as a as an all over even. Yeah. Design. Oops. So what are we doing next then that or you doing next? Are you doing the um, so next I, I went for the green first just to give the red a little bit of chance to uh, dry. dry. Mm -hmm. So now I'll fill in the TR and the I with the white present. Okay, excellent. You're going to cut these first in that. So you're actually going to cut the edge of the chrysanthemum first and then offer it up to the flat edge that you've already got there. Yes. Okay, so that creates a, a neater finish, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yep. Excellent. And I hope you're going out for the evening for dinner and you want nice red nails. <laughs> Now normally, obviously because we're doing this as a live stream, we haven't actually got time for everything to um, dry sufficiently before we work on the next section. But usually I'm anticipating that you would perhaps do one piece and then spray it and leave it overnight to dry before you work on it the next day, would you? Or? Yeah, um, if you do it the day before, 
um, and then let it dry overnight. You can then double check in the morning to see if the chrysanthemums have actually grown at all, mm -hmm. um, because quite often they do grow overnight. So therefore, you'll need to respray in the morning just to make sure you've got. So you just basically just it. touch it up um, on the places where it's yeah, just give where it the white started to appear. Give it another coat all the way over just to make sure it's fully mm -hmm. covered. So while Nat's doing that, let me just remind you um, to uh, like us on Facebook, visit our Facebook page, um, and see all of the different events that we've got coming up later on in the year, um, share us with your friends, um, and don't forget to let us know what you're doing as well, what you've got planned for the year, what exciting flower challenges you've got coming up. <laughs> <laughs> as we love to hear uh, what you guys have been doing and also we like to see pictures of what you've done as well it's uh, it's really inspiring to actually see um, pictures of things that we've demonstrated that you've then completed and come back to us and it's quite amazing how individual flowers are despite the fact that two people might do an identical arrangement there's still quirky bits that uh, are relevant to an individual person's personality and that's really nice to see so yeah don't forget to keep sending those pictures in to us and obviously if you've got any questions do pose your questions <laughs> and then I'll hand them over to Matt. <laughs> Is it kind of time of year where chrysanthemums are at their best or are they uh, all year round? They are an all year round um, flower now um, they are theoretically in season, sort of late summer, uh, September, yeah. October time is when their natural season is, um, for outdoor chrysanthemum anyway, sort of late summer, August, September. Um, but yeah, because everything's grown pretty much hothouse now, yeah. Um, yeah, we can get them all year round. In actual fact, in the flower industry, they have almost got a name as AYR chrysanth, which yeah. is all year round, yeah. so yeah probably one of the most popular flowers I guess in mm. the florist industry they're so they're expected to be all year round aren't they they are and they're, they're such a um, durable flower they've got a good lasting um, they've got good good longevity good shelf life and as you can see from what Nat's doing they're um, very um, what's the word flexible very versatile that's the word thank you versatile not enough coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next um, step then, Nat, is you're going to fill in the background, is that right? Yes. Okay, so is it just the same principle? You're using Baltica again, I see. Mm -hmm. And again, you're cutting the edges just to reinforce that defined edge. Yep. So are you spraying the background or are you keeping that white? Uh, no, that would be a white background. White background, okay. Yeah, if that was so going to be a, a coloured background, I'd have probably done started that with that first and, yeah. then, and done all the detail off the board afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I notice because the TRI of the logo is in white mm -hmm. and the background is going to be white, yeah. what will you do to define the edges? Um, I'll use a cord or a, a mm -hmm. wool or something like that just to go around the edge mm -hmm. and just to give it the shape. And obviously we'll show everybody later yeah. how you do that. Excellent. Obviously the larger the blooms the quicker they fill in with, yeah. <laughs> but the larger the bloom also the less definition you get. So I see you're using big blooms to go around the that main part of the triangle and I'm guessing you'll use slightly smaller ones yeah. to go around here will you? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, because now you're adding those white croissants next to the white tea, mm -hmm. yeah, that the tea almost disappears then, doesn't it? Now having said that, it doesn't too, because you've got those sharp edges, you still keep that defined line between, 
Mm. But from a distance, you wouldn't notice it, would you? No. Sometimes it's difficult if you're doing a um, something that's an all white picture, but just got um, detail, like a, I think I'd done a horse once, which was a, a shire horse, which was mainly white with um, black um, patches. Mm -hmm. That was quite hard because you had to um, base it all in the white. Um, of course, once you put your chrysanthemum on, you couldn't see the, the actual the definition. Yeah. Um, so afterwards, you had to get the picture back and then sort of do it by eye to um, get the actual yeah, whole definition. So it's kind of easier when you've got colours. Yeah. <laughs> got something to go by. You've got more um, defined um, sections then, haven't you, I yeah. suppose? Yeah. So just out of curiosity, if you didn't want to do chrysanthemum as a background, is there anything else that you could use um, to make a background, just quite a plain background? Yeah, you could use foliage. Um, yeah, um, any type of foliage would work really. Uh, you can also do leaves, um, if, if you place leaves flat onto the um, oasis base, then pin them and then pin over the one that you've already done. Um, so in effect you put a leaf down, pin it with a steel pin, then lay a leaf over the top covering that steel pin and then place another pin. So you're almost doing like a paving slabs almost I guess on top of each other. Um, but that gives you a very flat background. It doesn't give you any texture at all. It's very smooth, very flat. So you could do moss. Moss works very well especially for a tribute for example that is possibly um, sports related so you could create almost like a football pitch or a cricket pitch rugby pitch or even a golf um it's not a pitch is it golf course there you go <laughs> yeah the moss um uh, helps to create that kind of grass effect and there are so many different varieties of moss. You could use two or three different varieties of moss in the same tribute that would give you lots of different added texture. So yeah, yeah, there are lots of ways you can fill the background in. I have even seen before now where the background in small places hasn't had any filling, but it's actually been sprayed a colour. Have you seen that done as well? Yeah. Yeah, so you're using part of the Oasis frame to, to as an integral part of the design um, to be a little bit careful it doesn't look as though it's been forgotten <laughs> need to work it in to, to the overall finish fabric's quite a good thing to use as well mm -hmm. for background mm -hmm. i've used um, fabric before so would you pin the fabric on after you've done the main part of the design or did you put the fabric on first and then work the flowers around into that um I've done a couple of both ways to be honest. Okay. Um, so it just depends on the actual design. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I've done it both ways really. Okay, I suppose by putting the fabric on first, mm -hmm. you can then bring the croissants almost over the edges of the fabric yeah. so you cover yeah. the, the edges in. Yeah. Okay, so continuing on with our design, uh, Nat's been very, very busy and filled up the entire rest of the designer board with some white double croissants. Just showing you now how she's done that. So you've not had to do any trimming on these ones, have you, Matt? You've literally just put them in yeah. to, to, to create almost like a, a cushion effect, I guess, really. Yeah. Um, and you've only trimmed the ones that are around the main part of the design, is that right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And just to recap, you trimmed those before you put them in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Nat's just finishing the little gap. Okay, so what are we doing now then, Nat? We've got some hessian ribbon, uh, raw edge ribbon there, natural edge. Uh, and what are we doing with that? I'm just going to finish around the edges with that. Okay, excellent. And how are you going to put that on? You're just pinning that in? Yes. Okay, with, with little hairpins that you've made yourself, yeah? yeah. From wire? Is that yeah. silver wire you've used there or is that a, a yes. seven? It's a silver wire, is it? Yeah, a little silver rose wire. Okay just so it won't be shown. Okay, and is there a reason why you'd rather do that than use perhaps a um, steel buttonhole pin? Um, only because the holes on the um, hessian are quite large, so I was a bit concerned that the heads might actually go through right the way through the hessian and not hold it very well. And also this is almost like using a little um, attack, uh, one of the 
double-edged um, hmm, I've forgotten what they're called brain's gone dead um, but you've got almost two prongs there to help pin it yes. in haven't you so it gives extra Bit security yeah yeah you can get it through the holes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want me to move that round for you? Would yeah, that just, be show the, um, just show the video. You can just see what it'll look like before I turn it. Yep. Let me to hold that. It's all right. Lovely, thank you very much. Just pinning. Just thought it might be nice just to finish it with a nice bit of ribbon. This gives it that natural look. So what part of the foam are you adding it to? Um, so this is actually in the uh, softer part of the foam is where I'm pinning it in rather than the base. You probably wouldn't be able to do it so easily into the hard part because of the pins that you're using would you? Yeah. So there are lots of other different um, types of edging that you could do for this aren't there Nat? Yeah. Um, you could do a ribbon, pleated ribbon edge couldn't you? Yeah. Or a foliage edge if you wanted to. Definitely. Um, can't think of anything else at the moment that's coming to mind of what you could do. <laughs> you could use all different types of material for your um, pleated edge. So you could either use the, the plastic poly ribbon or you could do a nice um, chiffon or something like that just to make it a little bit nicer. And you can actually use two different coloured ribbons together, can't you? Or two different yeah. textures of ribbon together <coughs> to give a double. Um, fabric finish. Yeah. So that's what you've done there is very similar to what we would usually do a rose um, a pin for a rose sepal isn't it when you're doing yeah. buttonholes so it's virtually the same thing only on a slightly larger scale is that right? Yeah that's right. Okay, so now you're going to edge all the letters now, just to give them that little bit of extra definition, is that right? Yeah. I notice you put sellotape around the end of the piece of cord, is that just to stop it from fraying? Yeah. Yeah, excellent. And then you're using just basically a hairpin made from the 71 wires, just to pin it into position, is that right? Yeah, that's right. they go in. <laughs> I'm just adding a pin sort of just to secure it sort of almost on the curve is that right? Yeah just every, every little every little way. Just just to yeah, yeah just, just to, where you think really yeah um, that you don't have to have loads but just wherever you think it just needs a little bit more um, security. Now I can see exactly why you've um, why you need to put the sand tape on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Helps if you have a sharp pair of scissors as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're really bad for that here, aren't we? The trouble is, everybody picks everybody else's scissors up and cuts them at a different angle. You're quite good at managing to hide yours, though, aren't you, Nat? Uh, yeah. <laughs>
Okay, so carrying on with um, our design here, Nat's actually produced the finished product here. Um, she's added some cording, the word nursery, uh, finished putting the cording all the way around all the letters and uh, really pleased with the result. It looks really amazing. Well done, Nat. <laughs> so we have our triangle nursery um, logo. Uh, a really good welcome to the new year. Uh, so I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you've picked up some really good tips from that. Uh, so from both of us, Happy New Year and we look forward to seeing you very soon. Bye.